Th thank you very much. So when I first went to the United States for college, it was because I had this opportunity that uh, Fred has talked about, a scholarship to go to Swarthmore College. And then I went to Microsoft, and a year into Microsoft, I decided I'd never return to Ghana to work. Uh, well, back then, Ghana still had a dictatorship. A few years later, I became a parent, and then everything changed. Uh, that event caused me to really uh, grapple with the question of what world we leave for future generations. And at the time my son was born, there was a lot of bad news coming out of Africa uh, with Rwanda and Somalia and Liberia and other places. So I decided that my generation needed to be part of creating a brighter future in Africa for the sake of our children and, and their children. And, uh, and so I quit Microsoft and I've been on this journey. I've got to say that when I, when I look at the world today, what I see is that most of the development that, that remains in the world um, exists here in Africa. I actually have come to the belief that the 21st century will be Africa's century. Um, it has to be. And when we've achieved all this growth, the amount of wealth that will be created on planet Earth because of what happens in Africa will be incredible. If you look at Europe, you look at South, South America and North America, you look at Asia, you see that a lot of the work has been done. The new wealth is going to happen here. Um, but it really is fundamentally going to be a question of leadership, how the leaders behave on this continent. And like Fred, I decided that I ought to start by looking at uh, leaders um, as, as they're forming, start with the youth. And leaders is defined by all the decision makers, the people in positions of influence. Let's step back and talk a little bit about the wealth of nations. When we think about wealth in the world, what are we talking about? Uh, there's natural resources, there's infrastructure, um, and there's the value that is created in a nation, value created by people. So um, it's about these three things. And I would argue that most of the wealth of nations actually is from the citizens and the value that they create. And so the question of making this an African century really is a question of how do we empower the citizens of Africa so that they can create this value that is going to create this enormous wealth on the planet. And those people who engage with them um, are going to get very wealthy at it. But, but more importantly, humanity will be lifted uh, when this happens. Now, citizen contributions require um, a bunch of things. I mean, we all understand human capital. We all understand how important education is to that. But it is also the case that governance and the rule of law is incredibly important. Because without that, citizens are not empowered. And so if you educate people, but they don't have an environment in which to, to operate, um, then th they're not empowered. I want to just share a graph that, that tells a story um, about governance. Ghana here, it is not widely known in the world that in 1980, the per capita GDP in Ghana was greater than the per capita GDP in China. It is not well known that in 1950s, the per capita GDP in Ghana was greater than the per capita GDP in South Korea. So what happened? Well, look at the gradients. In 1992, Ghana became a democracy. Per capita GDP started to rise. Today, Ghana is a low middle income country. Um, even China, as it empowered its citizens, started to see 
a change in their, in their curve. South Africa. This is about when apartheid started to, to fail, or when it failed. The graphs change depending on how citizens are empowered. And in this particular case, um, I'm making the argument that democracy is a big part of empowering citizens. There's more, of course. I mean, education is a very important part of empowering citizens. But this is a dramatic result. And if you look at the world today, most of the advanced societies on the planet are democracies. Most of, most of the advanced societies are the ones that value innovation and that really empower people to be creative, to be innovative, um, and, and to create value for themselves and, and for their countries. So the role of citizens, the contribution of citizens, depends on creativity and innovation. But it depends on this word that is hidden in here, courage. Creativity and innovation, when you, if you think about it, is about the courage to imagine. We often think of creativity as imagination. But imagination requires courage. It requires an empowerment of a person to think of that new idea in the first place. It requires courage to act. And it requires courage to persist. Because when people come up with new ideas and they start to execute, usually the environment and others in that environment tell them, oh, that's crazy. That's not going to go anywhere. Imagine William. He had these three things. He had the courage to imagine. He had the courage to, to act. And he persisted. And so this is what is, what is required. And it turns out that actually governance also affects how brave people, you know, how encouraged people are. So my solution, we set up this college, Ashesa University. It's not really about the buildings. I start with that, those two pictures, partly because, well, the environment matters. But really, it's about the people. How do you nurture creativity and encouragement? For us, I kind of, I went back to my experience at Swarthmore College. When I went to, co to school in Ghana through high school, education for me was rote learning. Education was memorizing facts and repeating exactly those facts to my instructors. And then I went to a college that said, hey, we want you to think. We want you to solve problems. And um, I went there to study engineering, and they made me do engineering, of course, but they also required that I do other things, that I do literature and, and economics and, and art history and things like this. Um, and so for us, we're trying to foster creativity by embracing this idea of the liberal arts as core to what we do, um, because our mission is to educate and ethical entrepreneurial leaders in Africa. And to do that, you need to have, we need to have our students really ask the fundamental questions about what is the good society? What is the good society? What is truth? What is beauty? What should our roles be in the world? We, we married that with applied majors in technology and management. And then, we pushed our students to engage in, in a civic way. So in the classroom, having the debate, having the space designed to encourage debate and discussion, not only with faculty, but, but, but among the student body. Having an environment that encourages group gatherings to really grapple with these questions um, that I've described. And then magic happens. In 2008, our students enacted a student-run honor system for exams. And they said to us, we will not cheat, we will not tolerate those who do. We stepped out of the exam room, and they take exams unproctored. 
Fortunately, most of them have lived up to that code. Unfortunately, a few have violated the code. And fortunately, their colleagues have held them accountable. This year, they decided, hey, let's try to expand the code beyond exams. So they're talking about other things. I will not lie, cheat, or steal. Neither will I tolerate those who do. And to make a statement that as future leaders of Africa, they ought to not tolerate bad behavior, that they ought to care about the community in which they live, that they really ought to be the guardians of their society. And the requirement for being guardians of their society is to hold all leaders accountable, including their peers. When I came to the realization that I needed to be back on the continent helping with development, I originally thought I'd come start a technology company. And I changed my mind because as I looked at a bunch of different problems, I'd ask why. So take any problem and ask why and get a bunch of answers. And take each of those answers and ask why. And very quickly, I realized that regardless of the problem I was talking about with friends and family, leadership stood out as fundamental. And so then I went to look at the educational system, how the leaders were being educated. And they were being educated by road learning, from kindergarten through graduate school. And I saw university classrooms that were so crowded that kids were standing outside on the verandas looking through windows for their lectures. And I saw labs that didn't function. I saw kids who were studying computer science and programming by writing code on paper, not using computers. And I also realized, I read at the time, that 2% of college-age kids were in college in Ghana. Today, the number is closer to 5%. If you think about 2% or 5%, who are those people? They're the lucky ones, right? Um, but the problem with 2% or 5% is it's too small. But more importantly, it means that those kids in college would be running Ghana one day. I'll say that again. The 5% who go to college will be running the country one day. And so I realized that what I was looking at was what Ghana would look like 20, 30 years forward, when these people who were in their 20s were now in their 50s and were running the show. And so I completely agree with Fred. You start early, because that really is the predictor of what a society will look like. And I think that as we empower these young people, we will change the world. The amount of wealth that will be created in the world, a huge percentage of that will occur in Africa. Because this is where it has to occur. And the way we educate the future leaders will make all the difference in when that happens exactly and how it happens. Thank you very much.